Week one, we learned the do's and don'ts of our roles as wives and how to be an obedient and godly Christ-honoring woman. In week two, we learned that none of us, none of us, want to be that contentious wife or also, we don't want to be known as a hindrance to our husbands. We also learn the importance of faith, having it, stepping out in it, and living a faith-filled life that pleases God like Mrs. Noah did. Now this week, in week three, we'll be doing a continuation of faith as we see Abram and Sarai step out in faith as the Lord has called them to great things. And we'll also learn of the character of a godly wife that is precious in the sight of the Lord. So let's pray, and we'll get started. Lord God, we just thank you for bringing us here this morning. Pray that we'd fill your presence with us, God. I pray that you would speak and minister to each one of us, God, the things that we need from you today. Pray that you clear our minds and clear our hearts. We just look forward to what you're going to do in us and through us, God. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to start with, I'm going to focus on Sarah's, Sarah's character. And for the sake of this, we're going to change her name to Sarah right now. Her and Abraham's names don't change until chapter 17. It's in between both of our stories today. And it comes at a time when the Lord was reaffirming his promises to them. So when we first meet Sarah, when they go on their first move, she's 65. And Sarai, her given name means princess. So at age 65, she was an extraordinarily beautiful woman, a beautiful princess. And she seemed to get more beautiful with age. She found that fountain of youth, I think. Now, she was definitely human, which is always comforting to me, because God chose her despite her weaknesses. She had her faults. She had her lapses in faith. She argued with her husband. She acted unjustly at times toward other people. She had her downfalls. But God put a calling on her life, knowing all of these things. Do you ever agree to something, and then later you find out, well, this isn't what I signed up for. No one told me about this. God knew exactly what he was signing up for when he called Sarah. And he knew what he was signing up for when he called us, when he called each one of you his daughters. Because he knows our heart. He knows our love for him. He knows our faults and our flaws and our shortcomings, but he's able to see past all of those things. And he sees the good and not all the bad which is what we should do. We should look at the good and the positive in people and situations, not pick out the negative. The negative and the bad will draw you down. It'll bring you down. and It'll cause you to be ineffective for him. This world is negative enough, so we don't need to add negative Christians into the mix. Now, the New Testament looks at the positives in Sarah, and it portrays her as the mother of faith. She was a lifelong companion to Abraham. She shared his hope, his faith, and his promises. God had told them how he desired to use them, as we'll read, and the great things that would happen through them. There were times when their faith wavered, trying to take matters into their own hands in order to make God's promises come true. They showed a little impatience more than once, and God had to fix their messes. Do you ever feel like God has to fix your messes? Often. He promises you something, and you try to achieve it in your own strength, your own power, your own will, your own way. His will and his plans will come to fruition, regardless of you. 
but he desires to use you and to bless you and to grow you through the process. And when we yield to him and follow him, our faith increases and we're made more and more into his image and his character. Now, Abraham and Sarah are members of the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And I think it'll be up on the screen. I'll go ahead and read it in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out into the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. So Sarah, she was faithful, and she was beautiful, and not just on the outside, but on the inside too. First Peter 3, 1 Peter 3.1, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Now, being afraid here means... Um, it's not that you're necessarily afraid or scared unless there's a bad situation, but you should fear them in the respect, in the sense of respect and reverence towards them. Fear them. Now, I want to look at verse 4. It says, Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. This woman is the opposite of contentious. There is no contention in her. She is gentle and quiet. And I found this commentary, and I love how she explains it. it says, gentle does not mean passive, weak, or someone who cannot help herself. Rather, it means a controlled strength. Picture a mother cradling a newborn. She has the physical strength to harm that child, but she doesn't because her strength is under control. A gentle woman has a humble heart that bows itself before God, recognizes God's dealings with her as good, and chooses not to be contentious or, restraint or resistant against him. Quiet does not mean whisper, silent, or bland. Rather, it means tranquility, arising from within, and it includes the idea of causing no disturbances to others. It is an inner peace and a calmness in the midst of any circumstances. Gentleness and peace are fruits of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life and thus available to every Christian woman who desires them. If you know the Lord, you have these fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Learn that teaching my kids. Use these. You have them. You have access to them. Use them. Practice them. Memorize them. Now, in putting this into practice towards our husbands, let's say a situation happens and things don't go as planned. Do not snap at your husband or bite his head off. Do not degrade your husband. Do not call him names. Do not say, I told you so. You should have listened to me. Don't say any of those. Do not make him feel worse. If he's anything like my husband, don't make him feel worse than he already does if something doesn't go right. Our husbands have a huge responsibility in leading our family and making decisions, whether they're big or small. 
and we're there to help them, not to make things worse. If you're going to call them a name, call them honey or babe. We call each other babe, it's pretty funny. Or dear, you encourage him, you tell him that it's going to be okay. You say something like, well, what do we do next? Let's pray. Let's go to bed, let's sleep on it, let's see what God has for us in the morning. You make a bad situation better, not worse. And I want to touch on one more thing uh, before we move on. It's in those verses. Now, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We should take care of it physically and spiritually. And in saying that, I think that it's important that we look nice for our husbands. That we're put together when they come home. I believe that it blesses them. I don't think it's vanity. You know, I think that you, we can pull ourselves together for them. You don't need to be in a ball gown waiting for him with an updo, you know, when he gets there. But you can brush your teeth. You can comb your hair. Get some fresh clothes on. Maybe a little makeup. They say that a man should wreck your lipstick and not your mascara. So put a little lipstick on for him to wreck when he walks through that door. Honestly, if I'm not pulled together on the outside, I'm not very effective for the Lord or for anybody else for that matter. You would have a hard time taking me seriously if I was standing up here in my black and white slippers and my baggy flower pajama pants and my Star Wars sweatshirt, which I was wearing yesterday when I was studying. I hear a knock on the door and I thought, nope, nobody needs to see this. So I just let it go. So to keep the main thing the main thing, it's our spiritual beauty, it's our inner beauty, but I think that it's a good idea to take care of our outside as well. So now that we have a little background on Sarah, uh, we'll get into our verses today. If you want to turn to Genesis 12, we'll start there in verse 1. I'll give you a second. We're going to do some marathon reading. I tried to cut some verses out, and I just couldn't. So, reading all of them. <clears throat> Keep up. You ready? Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, Abraham and Sarah's journey started, um, their journey of faith, it started when he was 75 and she was 65, which means you're never too old for dedication to God's plans in your life. You're never too old for an adventure with him, so we can't use age as an excuse. Now, in the previous chapter, Abraham's father had died. The Babylonians, they were worshiping the moon god. And one teacher that I was listening to, she said that the moon god's name was Sin. So how ironic that the Lord uh, was telling them that they needed to get away from sin, get out, get away. So that's what he says in verse 1. He tells them to get out. Is there something in your life that the Lord is telling you to get out of, to get away from? Is there sin? Or maybe there's a situation in your life that is keeping you from fulfilling God's promises and his plans for you. Do what he says and get out. Take that step of faith and act in obedience and follow him. Now, also in these verses, the Lord is establishing his covenant with Abraham. And in verse 3, he promises the Messiah. The lineage of Jesus is going to come through the Jewish nation. It's going to come through Sarah and Abraham. So verse 4 So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. 
And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were there in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built another altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. So there's two things that I like to look at here first. Um, the first one is they departed and they left everything that they knew. The, in your lesson, this is the leaving and cleaving part. And imagine how Sarah must have felt leaving all that she had known her whole life. And she was 65, so that's, you know, she had a lot of friends and a lot of family and knew a lot of things. And they were going somewhere that they didn't know. The Lord hadn't told them yet. Now, I'm sure that some of you have experienced that, and maybe thoughts are coming back of having to do that. Maybe your husband had a job, or you had a job, or whatever, the Lord just up and moved you, so you can relate to her. I have always lived within a five-mile radius <laughs> of my family, my parents. Um, the farthest I've lived is 50 miles away. Sarah had to cling to God and to her husband as they began this adventure. Now, the second thing is the altar that he built. The altar was very important to Abraham because it was a place to meet with God, to offer the sacrifice for sin, to show submission to God, and to worship him. Now, as Christians, I think that we should have an altar. You don't have to bring rocks into your living room or into your bedroom, you know, by your nightstand. But I think that it's important to have some place where you go to worship the Lord. Some people have a literal prayer closet. I have a big chair. <laughs> I'm not looking over there, sorry. Won't name any names. And there's nothing wrong with that. If I had one, I'd go to it. I have a big chair in the living room. That's my altar. I think it's important that we should have a place that we can meet with God and that we can focus and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins submit ourselves to God as a living sacrifice and offer up our praises to him. Make sure that you're acknowledging his goodness towards you. Now, things start to get sticky here, and Abraham's faith is tested by a famine. Verse 10. Now, there is a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt, that he went to Sarai, his wife. Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it'll happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. So please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt and the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. Now, understanding the role of Abraham and Sarah, the role that they have in God's redemptive plan, we can understand how serious this is. God did not want Sarah's womb to be defiled by a Gentile king because the Messiah would come from her line of descendants. So this is a big deal. And this is one of those messes that I was talking about that God has to come along and fix. In verse 16, he treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram, and he said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife 
Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now God blessed Abraham even when he didn't do what he should have. God continued to protect him even when he lied. God did not call back his promise to him because the promise depended on God, not on Abraham. But unfortunately, he had to be rebuked by a pagan king. Now, my husband is not a good liar. His eyebrow twitches. It goes straight up, and you can tell. And uh, it's pretty convenient for me, not for him. But I just look at him, and I'm like, what is going on? And the kids, when the kids were little, they used to say, Dad's lying, his eyebrow is twitching. <laughs> now, me, on the other hand, knowing that I was teaching on these verses, I have been lying for three weeks. It just, they just keep flying out of my mouth, just these little lies, and I'm like, what is going on? And they're just little fibs, but still, I'm like, ah. And then I remembered what Paul says. And he says, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but that sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be the law that when I, do, when I want to do right, evil comes close at hand. And this has been my reality for the past three weeks. I don't want to lie. I don't consider myself a liar. I was thinking, Lord, I can't wait to teach on Tuesday, so hopefully I'll stop lying. <laughs> do you ever maybe something similar when you do your devos and it's really good and you feel really strong and empowered and then you just go out and do the opposite of what you just learned? That's how I have felt for three weeks. So, ladies, don't lie. God will have to come and fix your messes. All right, so let's skip down to Genesis 20, and we'll be in verse 1. Are you there? And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. They lie again. You would have think that they learned the first time, but it's easy to slip back into our sins, isn't it? You know those movies that have the alternate endings where, like, this happened, but then this could have happened? I'd like to see a movie with alternate endings for chapter 12, and chapter 20 to see how the scenario would have played out if they would have just followed the Lord. God's will is his will, and his promises are his promises, and they will come to pass. Obedience is the key for us. It's a lot easier just to submit to God and to do what's right by him. Now, Sarah, at 90, uh, she was 90 at this time, and she was still beautiful and attractive. But she was also connected to one of the richest and most influential men in the region. Abraham was a patriarch, and God was making him into a great nation. So he was continuing to gain riches and possessions and power. Now, in that day, a harem was sometimes more of a political statement than a romantic. So that might have been why he took her as well. Nonetheless, Sarah still had it. Now, I look at you ladies, and you're all so pretty. You're so beautiful. And you just get prettier with each birthday. The older you get and the more that you grow in Jesus, you just have this glow and this radiance that comes from you. And this twinkle in your eyes, I love to look into your eyes when I talk to you. That is Jesus in you, shining out of you. That is true beauty. We don't want to give too much credit to those makeup companies. So in Genesis 3, 
But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said to the Lord, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even herself, said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let, let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Whoa. Now, we know that any time God says surely, it's true, like in the garden. He told them surely quite a few times, and they didn't listen. But desperate times call for desperate measures. This was an awful thing to hear from God, even in a dream. But the point had to be made to Abimelech, even though he could truly say that he acted in the integrity of his heart and the innocence of his hands. And this may seem drastic, but the stakes were high. Suppose Abimelech had taken Sarah and God had not intervened. Two seeds would have been at the door to Sarah's womb, and to this day an element of doubt would cling to the ancestry of our Lord. So in the next chapter, um, chapter 21, we won't be reading that, but that's when she actually conceives Isaac. So praise God for his intercession. Okay, so we'll continue reading in verse 8. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How, I, how have I offended you that you have brought this on me and on my kingdom, this great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you have in view that you have done this thing? So for a second time, we see that Abraham is rebuked by the pagan king. And when he asked Abraham what he had in view, that he lied, he certainly didn't have the Lord in view. He failed to trust God. This is mess number two. And now Abraham has an excuse, and he's backpedaling. Verse 11, and Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will kill me on account of my wife. But indeed, she truly is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when it came to pass, when God had caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me. In every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. One commentator said, this was Abraham's excuse for his sinful deception but the real problem was that the fear of God wasn't in Abraham. If he really respected the Lord, his commandments, his promises, and his protection, then Abraham would never have trusted in his own efforts to keep his family together. This was another attempt to justify his lie by saying it was really the truth. But a half-truth said with intent to deceive is always a whole lie. Again, no lying. We're all going to be watching everyone's eyebrows when we leave this room, right? So verse 14, Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, male and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah to his, his wife to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver, Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. 
Now, a great cross-reference here is Romans 12, 20. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. And David Guzik says that these verses, they likely refer to the burning conviction that our kindness places on our enemy. And we see that we can destroy our enemy by making him our friend. And I love that. And I've experienced that. I've seen it happen before. Abimelech's actions are a perfect example of God's grace and mercy towards us. And I've given these definitions before. I think that they're worth remembering. Mercy doesn't give us what we deserve, and grace gives us what we don't deserve. Now, with this in mind, we see that Abimelech, he does all that the Lord says in restoring Sarah to her husband. But he also gives Abraham livestock and servants and land. And on Sarah's behalf, he told her that he gave her brother a thousand pieces of silver in order to vindicate her to clear her, to exonerate her before all who are with her, mercy and grace. I'm not quite sure how things worked back then, but I can imagine maybe the penalty should have been death for what they did. You know, they lied, and those horrible plagues came upon both households. But instead, they were set free twice in order to fulfill God's will and promises. And to me, this is a beautiful picture of Jesus and his great love for us. We were sinners, deserving of death. But by God's amazing grace, he sent his son to go to that cross on our behalf, redeeming us and restoring us to himself, giving us more than we deserve, an eternity with him, and all these blessings that we have in between. As I was writing that part, I was starting to get a little sentimental because Easter is coming, and I love this time of year, and I really try to focus and concentrate on what he did on that cross for us. So in closing, ladies, I just want to reiterate a couple of things. First, the Lord is faithful even when we are faithless. When we falter, waver, he is steady and constant. His plans will come to pass regardless of our shortcomings. And second, remember what's precious in the sight of the Lord, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Let's pray.